Good evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. My name is Joel Simon, and I'm a philosopher from the University of Texas, El Paso. And my name is Kim Diaz, and I'm a philosopher here at EPCC. Tonight, we have as our, our guest, we're honored to have, Ephraim Mayer. He's a professor emeritus of modern Jewish philosophy at bar -Lan University in Israel and president of the Internationale Rosenzweig Gesellschaft. Gesellschaft means society in German. From 2009 until 2017, he was the Levinas guest professor for Jewish dialogue studies and interreligious theology at the Academy of World Religions at the University of Hamburg in Germany. From August until December 2018, he was a research fellow at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton. For a few months in 2021 and 2022, he was a research fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study in South Africa. Among his latest works are Dialogical Thought and Identity, Transdifferent Religiosity in, in Present-Day Societies, Interreligious Theology, Its Value and Mooring in Modern Jewish Philosophy, Old New Jewish Humanism, Faith in the Plural, and most recently, The Marvel of Relatedness in 2021. And I have a copy of Dr. Meyer's book here, uh, Faith in the Plural, that we'll be talking about also today. Thank you for having me. Ephraim, th thanks again for joining us and taking the time. Just uh, how many hours ahead are you from us, you being in Israel and us being here in El Paso? What's the time difference? Um, it it's eight hours, I think. About eight hours. Eight hours, right. Okay, so thank you again. But I wanted to begin by asking you, what is religion? How would you define religion? It's a complex human uh, phenomenon. Um, it is something which uh, can contribute to civilization, but it can also destroy uh, civilization. And therefore, as Jose Casanova of Georgetown University has said, religion has a Janus face. It could be for the good or for the bad. So it depends how you are looking to religion. But the etymology is religare. It's uh, being linked, uh, being related. And it is that dimension in religion that uh, contributes to uh, 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 to civilization. So in that sense, I am very much interested in the dialogical or the social dimension of uh, religion. In that regard, our second question is, why is it important to study religion? But let me just twist that a little bit to fit your own background. So why is it important to study religions? Because you do a lot of work in interreligious inter dialogue, right? So why is it important to study religion as a phenomenon uh, that, that, you know, show, that we humans have developed with all these different ways of practicing it? Well, first of all, I see the possibilities uh, of religion. You know, um, religion is uh, situated in the right side of the brain. <laughs> the left side is the more scientific one. But uh, I think that it is a kind of knowledge also, a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, thinking, which is very colorful and with metaphors, etc. And I think uh, it can motivate people uh, to become dialogical. Uh, I'm very much interested in dialogue and existence as coexistence. And religion can really uh, contribute to that. Meaning, Religion uh, can be very bad. It can be used, uh, for instance, I give this example, uh, to murder Gandhi. Uh, Gotze, who was the murderer of Gandhi, he uh, related to the Bhagavad Gita in order to justify his uh, acts. But at the same time, we see how people like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Avram Joshua Heschel are using religion uh, 
in order to create a common world, to be there for the common good. And I think it, it religion has this social function. So I'm, I'm very, very early, I um, became conscious that, um, for instance, that the Exodus motif, the motif of Jews coming out of Egypt, can be used in a good way. Uh, Martin Luther King said, and uh, let my people go, which is really from the Bible. And uh, uh, so we see that the Buren in South Africa, they uh, they were thinking that they were the, the, uh, uh, the elected people and they created an apartheid with the same motif. Uh, and they went to more fertile land uh, when they were chased away by the by the British. So you see how one motive of Exodus can be used positively and negatively. I'm interested in the religious phenomena as as, uh, as having implications for society, and I'm very much. Uh, I think this is this is this is the backbone of um, of my thought. Um, I want to promote uh, dialogical thinking. I try to. Uh, uh, to see how, what what is the 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 motivation one can have uh, 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 for engaging yourself in a more just and good society. I wanted to go back. You mentioned that the etymology of the word religion is to be connected, to be linked, and to be linked to what? Essentially, to be linked to 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 other human beings, also to nature, uh, to everything. Meaning, I, I think that the most profound dimension in life is that we, that we are conscious that our life and our existence is linked to the existence of everything else. I learned that from the Vietnamese uh, spiritual master, Thich Nhat Han was uh, teaching beautiful things I have here on my table, a flower. Mm -hmm. Now, this flower is constituted by non-flower elements because this flower could not be here embellishing our home without the earth and without the air and without the sun and without the gardener. <laughs> so it, we are all linked. A piece of paper. Let, let's take this piece of paper. Tichnia Tang says, this piece of paper is linked to everything else, meaning it's linked to the tree from which it comes. But the tree needs the air and the earth and the logger, etc. So everything is linked. If you if you if you become aware of that, then uh, um, you you become aware of the interrelatedness of everything. So I can't possibly think about religion between uh, without uh, interreligiosity. It's why I uh, so very much appreciate Peter Fenn's, uh, another Vietnamese uh, idea, that uh, to be religious is to be interreligious. If, if religare is to be linked, so I have to be linked also to all other people who are also thinking about ultimate realities, uh, the higher reality, call it God or Tao or Nirvana or Trinity uh, or Frank or whatever. So I have to listen because we are all approaching the same thing. If we are not, not in completely separate worlds, then we are in one world and then communication between us is possible and certainly communication around this ultimate reality. Um, I want to draw attention to our for our audience back to um, Ephraim's book. I'm going to hold it up. Uh, it's the Faith in the Plural book, the one that he published in 2019. And 
speaking of being linked, all of these people, this is a beautiful image. This is a beautiful, colorful image, right? It almost looks like a whirling dervish to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and this swirling figure has within his gown that he's wearing all of these people with their arms linked, but they're all this, and you mentioned this colorful sort of experience that we get by understanding the world in this linked way, the world comes alive, it becomes colorful if we express all these different diverse perspectives. Maybe you could just say a little bit about this image um, and why this represents something important for you. Let's first of all give credit to the artist. The artist is Tornquist, it's a Scandinavian uh, artist, and uh, she made that uh, picture of Yosef, she called uh, Yosef our brother, and uh, as you know in the Bible, it's, uh, Yosef is depicted as having a multicolored garment. And, and I, I thought it is a, a beautiful thing to have it as a cover for my book on faith in the plural, meaning I have faith in plurality, but faith exists also in plurality. So it's double meaning of faith in the plural. But that image is beautiful because right. it shows the, 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 the rich uh, uh, plethora, the, the rich panorama of uh, all the religions uh, which try to say something about the elevated reality. And we are all trying to do that. The problem is that many religious people say, I have the truth and others don't. Or they only have it partially. And my religion is the best one. So I try to get away from that idea and seeing that all the human beings in their different religious perspectives try to say something on the ultimate reality, something which I can learn also. Because about this elevated reality, we do not know. We know the different perspectives. So if I want to know more about the transcendence or the elevated reality, I have to be in touch with other perceptions. So only when I am in touch with the other perceptions can I come closer to the ultimate reality. And therefore, the dialogue, the interreligious dialogue, is not only a possibility, a nice hobby. It's a necessity. I again, uh, yeah, it's remind esen you, it's essential. Peter Fan's uh, uh, a book, To Be Religious Interreligiously. So I think this is mm -hmm. this is the beautiful thing. If you if you if you take the the, the great thinkers like Maimonides, the Jewish thinker, medieval thinker, he says we don't we cannot talk about God. It's only a human language that we are using. And if you are if you are looking what in Hinduism when it says about God, they say about Brahman, they say neti neti, not this, not that. So they negate also. It's a negative theology. You see, in in all in all the religions, you have a kind of consciousness that um, that the ultimate reality is a high reality. God is a transcendent reality, but in order to, to approach this reality, you need other human beings. What are the Muslims saying? Allah Akbar. God is greater. He is greater. It's not God is great. God is greater, Akbar. Meaning this kind of consciousness, that there are different perspectives, that you can say that, okay, um, uh, you know, the, the Yastrov image of a duck or a rabbit. Is it a duck or a rabbit? It's a duck mm -hmm. and it is a rabbit. <laughs> right. <laughs> it is both. You can't say right. this is wrong or this is right. 
just as you have this kind of thinking about you know is the a, a representation of 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 our of our planet is it a globe or is it a map what is right is it a map or a globe it's a map and a globe so i see also the relations are different endeavors of the human being you know to say something beautiful about and good and uh, and right about about ultimate reality the problem is and that's an impediment that uh, people are thinking that the truth is only uh, there is only only one thing only one thing and it's my way that's the truth but here i have a healing uh, element because i think that the truth has to be done it's not a question of only thoughts it's something to be realized to realize mm. Uh, just a good society that's to 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 do the truth to verify Franz Rosen's fight. Uh, I was just going to uh, add to that that you know the verification is something we have to do ourselves, right? Yeah, it's something we have to practice and and put into motion. What is important is not knowing who has the truth. But knowing who is in the in the in the praxis, who right. is doing work on the ground, right. who is promoting our unity, and now I'm coming back to our picture in this and uh, the, the cover of my book, because if you look again at the picture, you see how there is in the garment of yourself, you see a unity. It's a garment. It's the unity, but. Mm-hmm. Very different people are there. Various cores are there. So there is not only unity. There is the multiplicity. That's right. So the danger is that we come to a unified thing which doesn't respect the differences. And another danger is that we only look at the differences and we don't look at the entire picture. So in my interreligious dialogical theology, I think I bring together differences and unity. I think that uh, I'm speaking now as a Jew, the one God implies also the unity of mankind. There is no possibility to approach one God if you are not caring for the unity of of mankind, of humankind. This kind of interrelatedness of religious thought and humanism, um, it's really um, something which um, I, I think is at the basis of my interreligious thinking. I want to ask you a lot of questions, Ephraim. But I, I, I want to follow up with something. Um, you know, what do you think about tolerance? <laughs> what do you think about tolerance? Because do we tolerate the intolerant? Tolerance is a problematic word because you you only tolerate with something you. Uh, you are really not agreeing with it. <laughs> My um, right. thinking is is more positive, meaning uh, uh, it's about it's about dialogue, about interrelatedness, about coexistence, about um, being human, which is being interhuman. It's about, in Tignat Hans' sense, being as interbeing, existence as coexistence. So I think about the possibility of enriching each other with our unicity. There is, on the one side, there is a unicity. And on the other side, there is the possibility of, of, of communicating that to others in a, as a gift, giving it to others, giving, giving your thoughts, your life to others. That's, that's the beauty of human life, to be there for others, to be present for others, to be a present also by being present. 
mm -hmm. uh, for the others. Sometimes I'm not present, but my wife Shoshi makes me present. And sometimes, sometimes my wife is not present and I make her present. So the, mm -hmm. we make each other present and that's a present. That's really a gift. Right. Meaning the beauty of humankind is in the fact that we are all unique, but that we are all linked, that there is a possibility of bridging, of communicating. On the one hand, being special as nobody else. I'm a unique human being, and my religion is unique also. <laughs> and all other religions are unique, and all other human beings are unique. But we have the possibility to communicate and to bridge. So if you put too much accent upon your specificity, that you are grounded and embedded in a concrete reality, which is the truth, of course. But if you are too much focused upon that, you miss the bridge and the contact mm -hmm. with the entire world. But if you are a cosmopolitan and you forget your embedded embedment in a concrete reality, then you miss also something. So I try to think both together. It goes beyond tolerance. It's not only tolerating another young being. It's promoting a young being. It's giving him life. It's, um, Rosenzweig would say, Franz Rosenzweig, the philosopher, uh, should and I very much <laughs> love and study, is he would say, we are commanded to love. There is no other possibility. It's, uh, so to say, they, they put the mountain above your head if you take this commandment, uh, 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 thou shalt love, it's okay. If you don't, I put the mountain upon your head, says God according to the rabbinical tradition. So we have no, according to Rosenzweig, we have no choice. We have to love. We have to be there for the human beings. We have to, to, to be related. And as religious persons, it's in our DNA that we are linked to others. That's religare, to be linked to others. Yes. And how, is, how is that for a response well, on no, tolerance? Well, I agree <laughs> with you. No, I, and I agree with you. And it's just that part of that difference is intolerance, right? Um, I'm all for pluralism, knowing well that part of this plur living with plurality and part of it's not just everybody that uh, that agrees with plural pluralism as a value it includes living with accepting not just tolerating but <laughs> working with the intolerant mm. but you know, that, that that that, I, that is yes. intolerant of me <laughs> i i think I, I, I can understand also your, your thought, because tolerare in Latin, it's to bear something. So we can bear each other. In the Bible, it says that God bears his people in the desert, <laughs> like a father, <laughs> you know. And if we are bearing the others in the etymological sense of the world, we are tolerant in that sense. Tolerare is to bear, to, to take upon your shoulders, so to say, like a father takes his child, so we have to care for each other. So in that sense, I would say, yes, tolerance is important. Um, that sometimes also uh, you have to, to, to see that um, uh, other people do not reach a higher spiritual levels, and you have to take them. It's a responsibility. This, and according to uh, Emmanuel Levinas and other great philosophers, the, the 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 responsibility, the ability to respond is infinite. So we are with this responsibility in order. And then we have to bear also other people. We are responsible for everything. Right. That's Dostoevsky right. 
in the brothers Karamazov. Uh, uh, we are all responsible for everything, and I more than everybody else. I very much believe in that kind of infinity. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful philosophy that Levinas says, you know, uh, the infinity comes from the the the, the 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 face of the other. The face is facing me. And this infinity in the in the command of the other human being to respect him, this infinity ruptures my enclosedness, ruptures my totality. I have the possibility to be responsible and I have the task and the command. We we choose left commands. <laughs> the command that is the command to be there for the other human being, to respect him, to not hurt him or her or they. Meaning this kind of infinity that ruptures my own totality is for Emmanuel Levinas the contact with the divine. So in that sense, philosophy and religion um, are, so to say, uh, linked to each other in Levinas's thinking. Although it's a very different language, language of philosophy is this abstract language, this logical language, and religion has this very different, colorful, metaphoric language. But they are linked, and Levinas says this very, very clearly. He says that the wisdom of love is something which the love of wisdom has to take into account. Philosophers have to talk also about the prophets. And it is important that philosophers always also talked about God. And it's not uh, like very frequently is done that philosophy uh, says that, you know, religion is an opinion. Well, actually, that takes us to, yeah, we might as well ask you this now. Yeah, there's that, there, you've, you've, you've brought up many, many different um, uh, ideas that we, hopefully, we, we can uh, work into a little bit more deeply, um, such as what is the relationship of religion to ethics? Or, you know, is there, is there a difference between religious ethics and philosophical ethics, for instance? But I, I just wanted to just affirm one other point about Levinas because <clears throat> you know we're both we've both been inspired by his work. And Levinas says about responsibility, you know, how much responsibility do I have? Do I just go this far and say that's enough? <laughs> you know. And Levinas will always say, well, you know, my responsibility is that I have one more I'm I'm responsible for one more responsibility besides, you know, just being responsible for what I'm, is given me. I'm responsible even beyond that. I'm responsible for you, too, and the choices that you make. And so that's a difficult question. That's a difficult issue. You know, how far does my responsibility go? I don't know if that was um, I wanted to. I wanted to echo that from the Buddhist tradition. Um, I'm going to mispronounce it, but Ephraim, you're probably familiar with it. Tenso Gyokum, it's from the Zen Japanese tradition. The, the idea is if you're cooking and, you're, and you are paying attention, you take care of your whole meal as you're preparing, right? And the whole point is in the mountain of virtue, not to let even one grain of rice slip out of your, <laughs> out of your cooking. You know, to, to be careful, to be mindful, to be attentive to, to what you're doing, as though you're a cook, making sure that you use everything productively, right? So this level of not just getting the meal out there, but what energy are you using and what ingredients, but even to a minute um, grain of rice to 
to be that attentive. Yep. So, in other point, words, how responsible am I? How attentive am I? How, all the way down the way, to a grain of rice. And the way you put it, how <laughs> present am I? Right. How how present am I in this very moment to the one I the, the you know to Shoshi or to Kim you know the one I love, but also to those who I have trouble with. Yeah. You know? Even those. <laughs> but I wanted to, well, yeah, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you because our show is philosophical dialogues from La Frontera, right? So from the border and in borders, there is, borders are interesting places because they connect, but they also separate. In my opinion, I think it's the people who live on the border are also one community as opposed to two separate communities because we're linked by that border. Um, and then there is a border of religion and philosophy and you started talking about it and I wanted to ask you, what is that, what are those differences and what are those similarities between philosophers and people who do work on religion? What do you think what are the similarities or what, what are the differences between philosophy and religion? I touched upon it a little bit when, um, when I was talking about um, the significance of uh, the wisdom of love. Uh, I would call religion the wisdom of love. Uh, in that sense, that the, the religious tradition, in the best case scenario, of course, is is a wisdom of love. So philosophy as the love of wisdom uh, cannot without uh, a tradition of uh, the wisdom of love. It's also a kind of um, knowledge. It's a a deeper knowledge um, and uh, which we only approach within metaphors and within uh, allusions. Um, But you see that, for instance, in um, the Song of Songs. I love the Song of Songs. If you would ask ask me what is your favorite text, I would say the Song of Songs, because that is the wisdom of love. It's about a, a, a man and, and a woman, and they love each other. But at the same time, it's about God and his people, Israel, or about if you are a Christian, God and the church, or whatever. So it's, it's a physical level. And at the same time, it's a metaphysical level. It's not a physical level that hints towards something metaphysical. No. It's the metaphysical level that is incarnated, embedded within the physical reality. This kind of thinking uh, pertains to the wisdom of love. Can the love of wisdom uh, neglect the wisdom of love? I don't think so. (laughs) I think that uh, we have to see that there are different kinds of knowledge. There is a knowledge, logical, but that is the the, the dialogical <laughs> uh, knowledge. And it could be that the dialogue is the very root of our logics. Could logics exist without dialogics? Isn't uh, the fact that we are, that we feel that we have to be logical, isn't it grounded within dialogue? Isn't it because we feel that we have to come to um, uh, to logical uh, thinking? Isn't that because dialogue precedes, so to say, logic? And so what is the relationship between um, philosophy and religion? I do not think one can reduce um, religion to mere opinion, as if it is not uh, a complete knowledge. It's a different knowledge. And that different knowledge, I think, 
could be taken into account, um, has to be taken into account. Look at Martin Buber, who in his I and Thou says that if I'm relating to a you, a human you, I'm in contact with the eternal you, with God. So very contact with God takes place within the interhuman dialogue. The fact that I am only I because I'm related to a you brings me in contact to the eternal you. Bobo says that very clearly. He says that um, the presence, the gegenwärtigkeit, the presence of one human being to another human being brings the eternal you into perspective. I'm emphasizing that because uh, Kim, uh, you, 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 you really um, saw this. It's kind of awareness, you know, of, of being there for everything you meet uh, when you are working uh, with with the rice. Uh, so it's it, it has to be a meditation. It has to be in an, in an awareness, and this being present is is a great is a great human reality. It touches the depths of our existence. So how can philosophy uh, not see that? That acknowledging is a deeper knowledge. It's not only about knowing somebody else. It's about appreciating it, about uh, seeing what is the deeper uh the image of God in the other human being, the deeper dimension in the human being. In the Talmud, there is Yohanan ben Zakai, who uh, was a great human being. Why? Because he saw the uh, the potential in any other human being, and he was praising the specialty of every other human being, of every uh, other uh, of of the of his of his own pupils. And it's why he was so good. He was not interested in praising himself. He always praised the others. So in that sense, he was present before the others, saw the potential, uh, was engaged, promoted the other. And that was his way of being in touch with what Buber calls the eternal you. I really think your, your, your response is just extraordinary. Um, on a number of levels, uh, and one of those is um, in this relationship of philosophy to religion, your response was, you know, on the one hand we have the love of wisdom and the, on the other the wisdom of love. But the, the, what caught my attention was uh, your comment about the relationship of logic to dialogue, dialogue or dialogic. And philosophers are, are uh, trained to look for, um, you know, how uh, speech acts are made up, and and how they where they come from and what they constitute, right? And so, what we then what you then have to look for is um, what is a foundational claim and what's a presupposition. What is the a priori claim? What's an a posteriori claim? And things like that. And so it seems to me that that comment, just about um, what is the relationship of philosophy to religion or logic to dialogue, gets right at that issue of what is the presupposition for doing any philosophy at all, right? And that's to understand that there is this dialogical moment or sociality that we're all embedded in. And one can, we can't get rid of that kind of sociality. And it, in the same way, as you mentioned about the flower earlier in our converse, earlier in our dialogue, right? The flower depends upon the air and the earth and the bee <laughs> that flies from, you know, flower to flower pollinating, right? 
And we humans as well depend upon this earth, so we need to take care of not only each other, but also the earth that we live in and we live from. You know, in, in the Jewish Christian traditions, we talk about creation um, and taking care of creation. But taking care of the earth itself is what's, you know, the presupposition for all of that. And so otherness, which you've also mentioned, is not just other humans, but it's these other things as well, the other environment we live in, you know, there our houses and how we build them and that whole horizon opens up then by working at this relationship of philosophy and religion in the way you kind of set it up. That was just a comment. It was well, thank a you very much, uh, 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 Shul, for this amazing talk because uh, uh, I, I indeed think that there are impl uh, profound uh, implications for ecology and for ca taking care of our, of our world. Um, the problems we have um, are there because um, um, uh, people, many people, um, have uh, have this uh, idea that uh, we cannot communicate anymore. Um, there is privatization of uh, almost everything, the individualization of it, and uh, we we lost the sense of community and of of being linked, of the religari and the profound sense of the word. But the difference is. The difference between us are not most of all the 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 in the, in the uh, cultural or social different or economic differences. They are the ethical differences, and that I learned from Emmanuel Levinas. Meaning, the other human being is characterized by an alterity, by an otherness which cannot be assimilated by the eye because. I cannot enough be a human being for another human being. That's what in the Jewish tradition is very clearly said. Um, the, the, the righteous, one measures him or her with the thinness of, an, of, of a hair. What is the meaning of such a sentence? The righteous human being is a righteous one. He is really relating. But when he is relating to the other human being, he becomes conscious and aware that he is still very far from reaching the infinite. Because Levinas says, the infinite, uh, you approach it, but the more you come near, the more you can measure the distance from the infinite. You start being a good human being, there is no, uh, no uh, limit on it. It's mm. limitless. And of course we are human beings, and that was the question you raised, uh, Jules. So we live in societies in which at least we must be equal. <laughs> and then Levinas says you have to translate the ethical, the high ethical demand in the justice, uh, in a just society, creating a just society in which at least we are equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing because uh, we are not in a struggle for life. We are, we, we, we are, we are all there in order to support each other, to be there for, for each other. And then at least let us have the minimum level that we are equal. So I think more and more that ethical um, demands have to be translated in political structures. Um, more and more that we are not saying ethics is there above and then you have the lower level of politics. No, I think we have to be more to relate it more, to, to bring it together. And um, it's, it's like the ladder of Jacob, you know, with, with his, the top in the heaven, and <laughs> but it's firmly on the ground. <laughs> so bring the things together, bring the ladder, the ladder of Jacob, you know, bring, bring heaven and earth together. 
bring ethics within the social and, and, and the political structures. More and more, I'm convinced that, that this is an important task. I would like to ask you, is it possible to be ethical without believing in a higher goodness, b without believing in God? Oh, Do you yes. think it's possible to be ethical without? Can atheists yes, be ethical? Yes, certainly. I think it's uh, this 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 question. The answer is, is clear because the Dalai Lama says that it is beyond religion, meaning you don't have to be religious in order to be ethical. And I do not understand people who are thinking about Jewish ethics and general ethics. I do not understand this kind of thinking. I think ethics is ethics, meaning it's, it's the human being is responsible for the other. But indeed, it is not something which is... Uh, uh, which is um, linked to, 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 to religion. You don't have to base ethics in religion. That would be a very bad thing. Uh, you have to, to be ethical uh, because, you are, uh, because you are a human being. You are, you are, you are there for the other. And uh, uh, to be there for the other is, is, is our elevated task meaning i'm thinking about the african culture i had now a little bit contact with it there is this great idea of the ubuntu i wanted to ask you about that so i'm glad you're bringing it up tell us more about ubuntu yes yeah, so the ubuntu is this kind of the great uh, uh, insight that I am because we are. And it's beautiful. You can see it in, in YouTube. There is this uh, game. An anthropologist uh, comes to the to children in South Africa. And, uh, and, and he says, you know, there are now a, 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 a lot of uh, sweet things. The one who reaches this uh, tree with the, uh, with, the, with the sweet things beneath, the one who wins the uh, running, he can have all the uh, sweet things. What are these children doing? They are taking each other's hand. They are running together and they share the, the, the sweet things. They share it. And then the anthropologists say, you could have it for you alone. And then mm. the children say, Ubuntu. I am because we are. We have to learn again this communitarianism. We have lost the sense of togetherness. The marvel of relatedness as the title of my last book. Last book says the marvel of relatedness, being there for the other. A couple of years ago, I was at a a lecture that was um, and I can't think of uh, of the person's name now, but it was a Native American philosopher. And this this gets to your idea from faith in the plural about trans difference. Mm. The phrase that he came up with is that um, we are all one because we are all different. So when we embrace that difference of each other um, and experience that, um, we can experience these sweet things as we share them with each other. We can experience the sweet treats of the, like children, you know, running along. I, I completely agree. I think this kind of uh, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, we are all special. But we communicate with each other. And the communication is rich because we are unique. It's not uh, notwithstanding our differences that, that we can understand each other. It's because of our differences <laughs> that we can enrich each other and being in communication with each other. And that's why I put trans difference at the kernel of my dialogical interreligious thinking. And therefore, um, 
it's it's like language you know language is something which you, you touched upon that problem uh, uh, because language is not a private thing <laughs> it's something which is there between the human beings and again i would i would think about rosenzweig who said that uh, every conversation is about translating and there's nothing which cannot be translated meaning of course we have all always our special things a special terminology etc but because we are human beings we can we can also translate okay so if i want to understand kim and jill what are what i am doing is that I try to understand your words in my words. And I want to, to, to communicate something, so I, I say it in my words, and, and you will translate it in your words. And that's the beauty of, it's, it's a great act of peace. Translating every, every, every conversation, the conversation which we have, is an act of peace. We are translating. We are communicating. There, there is a flow between us. And that's, that's I think, the, the, the crown, the, the loftiness of the human being. It's be, that's beautiful, Ephraim. I want to tell you, uh, Kim and I in our, our um, interviews try to get towards the end of the conversation, which is we're coming towards the end. Um, we want to get to this question of, do you think peace is possible in the world? And your comments about translation and those being acts of peacemaking, I think push us in that direction. You know, I, I think that that's a really profound and beautiful way of, of uh, expressing that, or, or, you know, preempting the question, <laughs> basically. You know, do you think peace is possible in the world? But in our acts of translation with each other and in, in us attempting to understand each other and to be gifts to each other, as you put it earlier in our, our dialogue, right? I think those are all acts or gestures of attempting to push forward this progress of peace in the way that we can. What do you think about that? An invitation to think about, about it. It's very difficult to bring peace in the world. Um, yeah. It's an enormous task. There is a lot of violence and a lot of uh, structural violence, economic uh, violence, social violence, verbal violence, physical violence, all kinds of violence, you know. And uh, um, so I think that uh, we have, uh, if, if we want to survive as, as human beings, we have to be linked to each other and to see what are the possibilities uh, hidden within other human beings. And it, it, it goes also so far as bearing the other human being, so coming back to the tolerant idea, bearing the human being. And it goes back to creating a just society and you have some time to, to be very active in order to do that. Which is not an easy task. Uh, but it's a beautiful thing, meaning uh, translating and having special attention to people who are threatened and people who are the victims of the violence. You know, this is within the Jewish tradition, we have this. Perhaps people forget it, but the Jewish tradition has it. It is written there that God takes care for the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. Mm -hmm. So that means that if that is a special attention, we have to take, it's a, it's a very humanistic activity. We have to take care of the people who are the victims of violence we have to take care of the weak sectors of the marginalized people 
because as as we said we are all linked we are coming back to this picture of a torrent twist and on the cover of my book we are all linked to each other and the richness of the human being is that we are taking each other's hand and we're not leaving it and i think it's a difficult <laughs> task but it's the most beautiful thing which we can do as human beings mm-hmm. i don't think that we can say anything more after that um so honestly i would just like really like to thank you for taking the time to meet with us for us to have this dialogue and hopefully this will inspire everyone who watches this to be responsible not just for themselves but for the other also so thank you so much Ephraim for being with us today today tonight <laughs> tonight for you today for us yep thank you Ephraim Thank you, Kim, and thank you, too, for having me. It was really a pleasure. This has been Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. Our guest, Efrain Meyer. My name is Kim Diaz. I teach philosophy here at EPCC. And my name is Jules Simon, and I'm a philosopher from the University of Texas, El Paso. Please join us next time. Mm-hmm.